SIBO versus IMO. Which one are you dealing with? Well, for those with unresolved gut symptoms, this is a relevant question. Many think that they need to get into the nuances of testing and completing multiple extensive protocols to correct the problem. However, the reason for continually struggling with these conditions is because you don't have a simple comparison that illustrates the differences and makes the correction process much simpler. If you'd like to see that comparison, keep watching. I don't know about you, but I like simplicity. Black or white, yes or no, left or right, up or down. That's the kind of straightforward I prefer. Now I could be wrong, but I'm certain that you want this too, rather than complex and boring. So let's apply that mindset to differentiating between SIBO and IMO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and intestinal methanogen overgrowth. And rather than just talking through all the differences, let me show you them with a side-by-side -side comparison so that you can easily understand which one you're struggling with and the best strategy for diagnosing, correcting, and preventing recurrence. But before we get started, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Arland Hill and I help first-time and recurrent SIBO sufferers restore their gut function by targeting all three phases of the condition to resolve symptoms in a timely manner. Now, let's get into the comparison. So, right off the gate, we're looking at the organism type. When it comes to SIBO, we're talking about coliform bacteria. And that's a fancy way of just saying bacteria that generally exist and proliferate and predominate in your large intestine. And these go by names that some of which you'll be familiar with, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, but also Bacteroidetes, Lactobacillus, Estrichia, Klebsiella, Proteus. In contrast, when you look at IMO, IMO is not a grouping of organisms. Generally, it is a single organism. It's what's known as an archaea. But more specifically, the predominant archaea that we often talk about goes by the name of Methanobrevibacter smithi. Just know it's an archaea and not a bacteria. That's the important point here. And when it comes to the number of species that are present during these overgrowths, when you're looking at SIBO, again, there's generally multiple of these species. They're not, it's not one single organism that you're typically finding. Whereas when we talk about IMO, again, it's the Methanobrevibacter smithy. It's that one organism. That's typically the one you're up against. Now, location is important here. And when it comes to SIBO, location is pretty obvious. Because we're talking about, as the name implies, the small intestine small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. However, when we start to talk about IMO, that's not the case. IMO can be present in the small intestine or the large intestine. So it's not limited to one core area. It can be found throughout the entire gastrointestinal tract. But you're probably here today because you're dealing with symptoms or been dealing with symptoms and maybe they're not correcting and you're trying to figure out well, which one is more likely to be present with SIBO versus with IMO. And when it comes to your common symptoms, SIBO is going to present more with gas, bloating. There's going to be often distension associated with that. You can have pain that's often linked to this. And you're going to have irregular bowel movements. They can be slow or fast, constipation or diarrhea. But when it comes to IMO, we're looking at the production of methane. And that typically slows things down in the gut. And that means that you're more prone to constipation. And oftentimes with constipation comes bloating. So that's typically what we see when it comes to IMO, more of a predominance of constipation and bloating. But there's got to be other effects that are associated with these conditions. Well, no doubt that there are. So let's talk about the risk of nutrient deficiencies. Well, when it comes to SIBO, the risk of nutrient deficiencies they're extremely high. These organisms that, come, that uh, make up SIBO, they're notorious for stealing nutrients and inhibiting the production of the nutrients that come from our beneficial bacteria. And they often manifest in things like B vitamin deficiencies, uh, fat soluble nutrients like A, D, E, K. We also see mineral deficiencies. It's not uncommon to see protein deficiencies associated with SIBO. But when you look at IMO, that's not the case. 
IMO isn't linked to nutrient deficiencies. Now, granted, this hasn't been significantly studied, but when we look at some nutrients, for example, B12, there hasn't been an observance of B12 deficiency. So in general, we think that when it comes to your IMO, the risk of nutrient deficiencies, well, that's significantly less. But there's also the association to other conditions, other name conditions. Some of these you're going to have heard of. And SIBO is linked to numerous other conditions. For example, hypothyroidism, Parkinson's disease, obesity, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, other metabolic disorders, depression, autoimmune conditions. Well, what about IMO? What's it linked to? Well, to date, there aren't any conditions that it's directly linked to in the same way that SIBO is linked to conditions. But what if we ask a different question and we we instead ask, well, what are medical conditions that would have uh, that would create an increased risk for development of one of these two, IMO or SIBO? Well, when it comes to SIBO, if you've had gastric bypass, what's often known as a Row and Y procedure, uh, if you have diabetes, if you've had your gallbladder removed, those are all going to increase the risk for SIBO. But when we look at medical conditions that or procedures that increase the risk for IMO, well, again, to date, there aren't any. So none that I've been able to isolate with any consistency in the evidence base. And that all leads us up to now that you know what the presentation is going to look like, what are the risk factors, what are the associated concerns, well, hopefully we, need, we can diagnose these conditions so that you can ultimately move on to resolving them and eliminating them. So what about our diagnostic options? Well, when it comes to SIBO, we have what's known as small bowel aspirate or breath testing. Now, small bowel aspirate is taking a biopsy in your small intestine, intestine and sampling the bacteria there and seeing if there's an overgrowth based on that sample. There's a lot of limitations with this methodology, so it's not, an, it's not a great methodology at this point, which leads many individuals to lean back towards breath testing, which, in fairness, has its own limitations. But when you look over at IMO, while breath testing is still the diagnostic option of choice here, the specificity and sensitivity, whether you're actually getting a true false reading when it's false or a true positive reading when it's positive, that is much better when we start to talk about IMO. And when you look at levels of the gases, so when these breath tests, what they're actually looking for are different gases. The predominant gas that we're looking for when it comes to SIBO is going to be hydrogen, and the predominant gas when we start to talk about IMO is going to be, as the name implies, methane. The levels for creating a positive are significantly different here too. In fact, the standard for hydrogen with SIBO is greater than 20 parts per million, whereas when we look at IMO, it's greater than 10 parts per million for methane. And there are typical patterns that are often seen with these tests. For example, an, in, a typical pattern with SIBO is going to be an increase in hydrogen over time. So it starts out within a more normal range, but it increases over time, typically within a two to three hour range. When you look at IMO, that's not the case. IMO is going to start high and it's going to stay high. And that's simply because methane, well, it doesn't fluctuate. And when you look at the requirement for how many samples you need to give during this time to get an accurate measurement, well, when it comes to SIBO, you need to have multiple breath samples to be able to get a, a pattern that you can put some degree of confidence in. That's not the case when it comes to IMO. You could do a single breath test and get the reading that you're looking for as it relates to IMO. Well, more so with this testing, since we're on that topic, we need to know how it correlates. So how does it correlate to severity? Well, when it comes to SIBO, well, it turns out the breath testing doesn't really tell you about the severity. There's not a linear association with that. But when it comes to IMO, yep, that's the case. There is a linear association. The higher your methane levels, the worse your case of IMO, and the greater the severity is there. But we can also have correlations to improvement. So does breath testing help show a correlation to improvement in SIBO? Maybe. We don't know definitively, so we're just going to have to leave it at maybe.
But when it comes to IMO, yes. If you see an improvement on the test, symptomatically, you're improving and there is a reduction in your archaea levels linked to IMO. Well, what about showing improvements in treatment response? Well, when it comes to SIBO, that's also a maybe. But when it comes to IMO, yes. Breath testing is going to be able to show you a treatment response and that that treatment was successful or unsuccessful. Which takes me back to a point that I briefly made earlier about the sensitivity and the specificity of breath testing when it comes to SIBO. Well, let's just use the term mediocre. It's mediocre at best, I would say. But when it comes to IMO, it's actually quite good. The sensitivity and specificity are good with IMO. So if you see a negative on a test for IMO or you see a positive on a test for IMO, chances are you actually have what the test is reflecting that you do or don't have. Which moves on now. Let's move on away from testing and let's talk about other aspects here of this, which is looking at are the results of the testing are they affected by the transit time from the mouth to the intersection between the small and large intestine? This is what's known as the orocecal transit time. But again, it's just the amount of time that it takes food to go from your mouth down to the cecum, which is the connection between the small and large intestine. And does that transit time affect testing? Well, when it comes to SIBO, yes, it does affect testing. So if you've got a slower transit time or a rapid transit time, that all can affect the outcomes when it comes to SIBO. However, when we, look, when we look at IMO, that transit time, it doesn't have any effect on the breath test for IMO. So whether, you're have a, whether you have a rapid transit time or a slow transit time, if it says that you have a positive on the test for IMO, if your methane levels are above the 10 parts per million, you've got a positive IMO presentation. All right, so let's move from testing, talking about that, and let's move into treatment now. And what about treatment with antibiotics? Well, when it comes to SIBO, you can treat SIBO with a single antibiotic. For example, things like rifaximin, metronidazole, neomycin. There's other ones that could be used, but those are more of the common ones that are used. They can be beneficial in a single, with one single antibiotic. However, when you look at IMO, it's a different story. Intestinal methanogen overgrowth requires that you're going to have multiple antibiotics. So just giving rifaximin, that's not going to make the mark that we need it to. It's going to have limited effects. So you generally are going to need to combine multiple antibiotics together. For example, rifaximin and neomycin or rifaximin and metronidazole. What about botanicals? Because not everyone wants to go the route of an antibiotic. So that leads someone into the direction of botanicals. Well, when it comes to treating with botanicals, SIBO is going to require multiple botanicals to be effective, but this is not in this case any different than IMO because IMO is also going to require multiple botanical antimicrobials to be effective. And now if you begin to think about what is going to, once we've got past the treatment phase, what is going to be required to prevent recurrence and to make sure that you don't end up back in this situation again? And so now we ask the question, was well, there required follow-up digestive support when it comes to SIBO? And the immediate answer to that is yes. The breakdown in the production of acid, enzymes, the secretion of bile, the uh, changes in the motility of the bowels, these are all going to affect the presentation and the possibility for developing SIBO. So we actually want, we very much want to think about digestive support as a follow-up to SIBO. But this is not any different than IMO. IMO is also going to require the follow-up digestive support as well. So in either category, we need to figure out, or for either condition, we need to figure out which of those are a limiting factor for someone and how we can support that. And that leads us into another type of testing altogether, which is stool testing. So now we ask the question, is adjunct stool testing beneficial? Remember, breath testing is the preferred methodology for, uh, for looking at both SIBO and IMO, but 
is there a place for stool testing? And the short answer to that is yes, there is a place for stool testing in both SIBO and IMO. And the reason for that is that one, it does help us have a better understanding of the ecology, the bacterial landscape, the overall microbial landscape in the gut, and which organisms might be influencing the uh, presentation of SIBO or IMO just off the top of my head, one that comes to mind for that is H. pylori. H. pylori can be linked to SIBO. But another reason is that I mentioned these digestive, supporting these digestive secretions. Well, how do you know if you need to do that? Well, stool testing can provide that information. So if I want to have a better understanding of the necessity to provide acid as a digestive aid or pancreatic enzymes or supplemental bile, the use of a stool test is going to help me in being able to do that. So there's your comparison. And so I ask you at this point, was the comparison helpful? If it was, feel free to share it with others you know that are dealing with gut symptoms and even share it with your doctor. See if there's a way that with them watching this information, they can help you out as well. And so now I have another video for you because I know you're ready to get rid of your symptoms. So this video will prevent you from making the top five mistakes when dealing with SIBO. Take a look.